with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. 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 This morning and maybe for the next few weeks, this subject. The Father's heart for you. The Father's heart for you. Had no idea when the Lord was working this into my heart that on this Sunday morning, as we would start this brief series, that our daughter Katie, we have Abby, Katie, Evan, that Katie, right at this moment as we speak, is in the Santerra Methodist Hospital giving birth to our third grandson. How about that for time? His name is Silas, like Paul and Silas, Ritter. Now, I, I, how, how, many, how many grandparents do we have in this room this morning? Would you raise your hand? How many parents do we have in this room? If you're a grandparent, you're a parent. Now, here, here's, here's the thing. You, you need to pray for the preacher this morning. Because my body is here, but there's another part of me that's in that hospital room up there and off of Santerra, Santerra. There's no way to put into words a father's heart, given the topic, or a mother's heart, but a parent's heart for a child that you know is in the process of facing something that is very painful, very difficult, and potentially very dangerous in order to give birth to a brand new little life. Life has parallel tracks that can be difficult for us, but with God, he sees them as parallel tracks, not contradictions. Just about five weeks ago, my 91-year-old daddy, preacher daddy, went to be home with Jesus. Five weeks after that, we're looking forward to having a brand new life in our family. Many of you, many of you have walked those same tracks. You, you've been down those same roads. It's, it's an amazing life that we live that will have both death and life as a part of it, death and birth. But as I stand here with you today, I, I find it easy to try to express the kind of compassion, the kind of um, hope that there is as Katie is in the process of giving birth. Her, her contractions are at about three minutes apart. Um, we have a few other medical details that we don't need to go into entirely at this point in time, but we're getting close and closer. And so if all of a sudden I just break and run, that means uh, I'm going to go check my phone and then I'll be right back. So <laughs> just hold what you got and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through this. The heart of the Father for you. You know, if you, if, if you didn't have a dad at home, it can be hard to define, get a grip around what it would be like to have a father's heart for you. If you had a father who was difficult, if you had a father who always seemed to have a standard higher than you could reach, if you had a father whom you never really were sure was pleased with you, was satisfied with you. It can be difficult to 
see this in a positive term, the Father's heart for you, because you either didn't have a father that expressed a heart, or if you had a father whose heart you never really understood, you never could touch, he never let the heart be known except when he was mad or except when he's disappointed. I need to tell you who your real daddy is this morning, who your real father is. If you've come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, if when the Lord was knocking on the door of your heart and you opened the door of your heart up to him and you invited Jesus to come and live within you, to bring his forgiveness that he won for you on the cross 2,000 years ago when he died in your place for your sins. He rose from the dead to prove that you have been forgiven. If, he was, if, there, was some, if there were bones, if there was genetic material still in that tomb, it would be proof that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough to satisfy the debt of sin that you and I would accumulate. But because the body was raised, and because Jesus was seen alive, it was proof that whoever will put his or her faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you're forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Other people may not forgive you, but the Lord Jesus has secured your forgiveness. When you and I put our trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord, then it, the Scripture specifically says, John chapter 1, but to as many as received him, Jesus, to these God gave the right to be called the children of God. <laughs> you are a child. You're not just a creation of God. You're not just something that God has formed. You are a child of God. That There's a difference between a piece of furniture that a, a wood craftsman can make and somebody who lives in his home and eats at his table and carries his last name. There's a difference between being a creation of God and being a child of God. And the child of God, that entity, that description, that title, is ours through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Now, here's a very interesting thing. Two times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul will reference something that happens as the Spirit of the living Jesus is poured out and is filling the life of one of these children of God. He uses the same description, Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4 will say, when the time was right, the Son came, the sacrifice was made, and now the Spirit of God is being poured out into the children of God, and the Spirit of God is crying out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. It's the cry within the heart of a child of God of affection for the Father knowing that there is a place in the Father's heart that I have. The Lord doesn't have any stepchildren. The Lord, only, the Lord only has all adopted children with the full rights and privileges of a natural-born child. That's who you are. But here's, we've been talking for these last few months about, about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. That's the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father, as we've been over this, remember the context of this, the promise of the Father was not Calvary, it was not the cross, it was not the blood of Jesus, it, it was not even the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. The promise of the Father was that the day would come when he would pour out his spirit into you so that you're not just a human, you are a human saturated, filled with the spirit of the living God. Jesus would say, but you wait in Jerusalem. Don't go be trying to evangelize the world because you don't have strength. You don't have ability. Here's what you do. You wait until you receive power. 
And when you receive my power, then you will be witnesses, be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of the Lord came and filled those 120, filled the Simon Peter who had, who, who had denied even knew the Lord. But now something dramatic had changed within him. He was no longer a coward. He was no longer hesitating on who Jesus was and his relationship with Jesus. He was bold as a lion because the spirit of the lion of the tribe of Judah was now operating inside him. That is not just intended to be for a select few. That's the only reason the church of Jesus Christ got out of the first century and into the second century and out of the third century when there was incredible persecution nationally and internationally against the church, the followers of Jesus, but because it was the living presence that by the Spirit of Jesus had worked inside them, they became fearless. They were willing to lay aside things and sacrifice things and walk away from things because they had the sense, the real-time sense of the presence of the living Jesus, not just remembering what he said, not just remembering what he did, but the sense that he was alive inside their chests, that the living Jesus was alive inside their minds, that the living Jesus was alive working in and through them. Folks, that's what it means. That wasn't just for the first century. That's supposed to be our position and our possession and our place of operation today. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with the spirit, not of the ostracized Jesus, not of the weakened Jesus, not of the human Jesus. Fill me with the spirit of the exalted, resurrected King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus. Now, I know some of you say, well, that, that's just what preachers are supposed to holler about and spit for the four, 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 five rows. That, that's what they're supposed to. No, no. That is the intended possession of you. If you've come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, not just to be a pew sitter, not just to be a, a hymn singer, not just to be a check the boxes kind of a Christian, but somebody who, whether you're in the church house or not, whether it's Sunday morning or Friday night, there is the sense of the living presence of Jesus Christ pulsing inside you that causes you to know you're not alone. I don't ever stand by myself. I'm always outnumbering the ones who are opposing me because the king lives in me. That'll, that'll do a number on your self-confidence. That'll do a number on this sissified baby, wavered, always timid and always hesitating. You'll be proud of who you are, not because of who you've made you, but because of the one who has chosen to set up his place of operation on this earth inside you. Paul will say, Paul will say, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, you look on the earth and try to find where God is, you look into the life of someone who knows Jesus as Savior and Lord. We are the temple. He lives here. You, 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 you don't leave Jesus when you walk out these doors or when you close your Bible, that he stays in the Bible, or he stays inside this sheetrock and ceiling tile. If you've owned him, claimed him as your Savior and Lord, every step you take, everywhere you go, every conversation you have, he is in the middle of it with you. Now, we're going to sing at Christmas time and talk about Emmanuel. What's the meaning of that name? God with us. Paul would put it this way. It is Christ in you who is your hope of glory. Not just God around me, not just his truth that I hold in my hand, but Jesus Christ absolutely and literally alive in us. Amen. Preach it. Preacher. Yes. Oh, that's good news. Hope in that. Okay. That all being said, what does that have to say to us about the Father's heart for me? I got to tell you, I grew up in a 
in a, in a wonderful home in many, way, many ways. I, I grew up learning as a child, small child, memorizing the scriptures, singing the songs, learning the, 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 the traditions in the best sense of the church. I grew up in that. But, but also grew up in a, in a home where the, the standards were real high. And I had a, I had a wonderful father in the sense that, that I knew he, he loved us because of his determination to take care of us and to be protection for us and, and so forth as that was needed. But I don't remember ever hearing my daddy say, David, I love you. Or I'm proud of you. I, I think that may have been some of how he had been raised and things get passed on and and in, in, the, in the raising of children in the at family settings. And, and so I, I grew up never really feeling like I had lived up to my, my dad's standards, that, that he, he set the bar pretty high, and, 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 and you know, you, you, you mess up, and discipline wasn't very far behind. We, we didn't have a negotiation session. I didn't know a whole lot about time out. I knew a lot about my backside getting blessed a little bit. But, you know, some of these later developments of things, I, I, I have to look at with, well, no, that's interesting. <laughs> but, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not disdaining that because the Lord must have known I was a hard head and I, I needed somebody who could help me with my hard-headedness and so forth. But I, I never... I never got the sense from my dad, though my dad knew the Lord, loved the Lord, taught the Word, was a wonderful preacher and communicator of God. But, but I, I didn't get the sense of the love of God from my dad. I, I didn't get the sense growing up that, that he was pleased with me or he was satisfied with my life. I, I, I had to kind of fill in the blanks and maybe think that hope that that's what it felt like. But I came into young adulthood with that sense of feeling like God was more like the earthly dad that I'd had or at that time. I need to hasten to say in the later years of his life to joy that is beyond anything I can express, there would never be a phone call. There would never be a visit face-to-face. Or my dad wouldn't look me in the eye or say it very clearly over the phone, David, I love you, and I'm proud of you. I love you, and I thank the Lord for it. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an adult. I'm a grown adult. He's, he's an aging adult, but that would be like water to my soul to hear those words. But during those times, and I speak with reference not only to my story, but to many of your story, I believe. D during those years when there was not that sense of really knowing for sure where I was standing in my father's eyes. And that God would be likened unto the dad that spoke to me, that I saw, that I was around. He, he represented... It would be hard for me to really get my hand around verses like, as foundational as, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. I would have to theologically tweak that word for love or, or put it in a different, for God so loved the Baptists, for God so loved the ones who went to youth camp every summer in their life, for God so loved the good Americans that he gave his own living God. I, I had a hard time really embracing this truth that is so clear in the scripture that before anybody repented, before anybody knew the name Jesus, followed Jesus, left their boats in the Sea of Galilee and started walking with Jesus, before there was any change in anybody anywhere in the human race, 
God loved people. It, it, it wasn't about whether they jumped over the bar. It wasn't about whether they behaved correctly or not. It was that God foundationally as a part of what his heart is. God loved the world. You know what it took for me to begin to sense that? And I've told you this story before, and I won't do a whole lot of it again, but there was a drug addict in northwest Houston in the area where I went to high school in the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, he was just known as a sleaze bag. He was known as the one who in some ways ran the streets, Ella and Shepherd, that part of Houston. But one day, I'm in church, minding my own little preacher kid business, trying to stay awake. And I look up there in the choir loft, and there is that <laughs> drug addict, Ross Hargrove, sitting in the choir loft on a Sunday morning. And I thought to myself, what? Is, I didn't say it out loud, but what is he doing here? Doesn't he, is he so high he doesn't even know he took the wrong door and he's in the choir loft? But what had happened is that that drug addict who had trashed his life and his parents had had to basically kick him out of the house because he had a younger brother coming up that he was souring to. Guy had gone to a surf contest on Padre Island during the Easter time, and he was he was sleeping on the beach in a tent, and somebody come by there as he, and then he ends up in a in, in a restaurant. I think I'm getting let me get this right. It was in the restaurant where this happened. He's sitting there trying to get some breakfast. Hair, no shirt on, hair down the middle. I heard him tell this story a hundred times. And a guy walks down the line of the bar in the restaurant handing out these little pieces of paper, as he called them. And the little pieces of paper said things like, Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? And the guy that was passing these things out looked at Ross and said, I just want you to know I used to look just like you. And Jesus Christ changed my life. Well, it just... It just irritated Ross. He was just trying to get some pancakes or some eggs. And, 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 and the, guy, the guy said that to him. And he said, well, just give me a piece of that paper. Give me a piece of paper and, 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 and I'm, you know, leave me alone. Well, he took the little piece of paper. All during this drug-infested surf contest, sleeping on the beach, all this stuff. He read that piece of paper. And by that time, he had trashed his life, couldn't even hardly go back home. He was just known as a former Eagle Scout, but had now become just a druggie and a dealer of dope in Houston. He hitchhikes back home. <laughs> I love telling this. I've been telling this story for 40 years, and I still get fired up thinking about it. Ross ends up back at his house in northwest Houston, walks in. His dad says, you're going to have to leave because Randy's coming up and you can't stay here and live like you're living. He steps into his shower, turns the water on, standing there, and he's just saying, he, this is what he said, God, I don't even know if you're real, but if you're real, I need you to help me. That was it. It was no Jesus. It was no going through the Roman road. That was just that cry, that cry. He said, I heard a voice. And the voice said to me, I am the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have come to you to cleanse you from all the poisons that are in you and that have been put in you. He said, I said, Ross, later, did you, was it a voice? Did you hear an audible? He said, I don't know if I heard an audible voice or not, but I heard it, and I felt something. And I got out of that shower, dried off, and went in and told my dad, Dad, I feel like 
I feel like the Lord's come into my life. His dad, who had been through all the heartbreaking of that kind of a track record with a, with a child, grown, grown into late teens, early 20s, the dad basically said, all right, well, if, you, if something's really happened to you, you go cut your hair. That's what he said. Ross went and cut his hair. And it wasn't long after that that he was showing up in the choir loft at my daddy's church. And I found him. I found him. I was scared of him really before, but I found him. And when I looked into the eyes of that young man, there was life in those eyes. There was a, there was a fire of joy in those eyes. There was a smile on his face. He, he, did, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, but he was just blessed by the words that were talking about the Jesus who had loved him and the God who was having mercy on him and the fresh chance and the new life and the hope that was coming. And I was just, in a good sense, intoxicated by that joy in him. And what had happened to him, was that it wasn't the law of God that broke him. It wasn't the severity of God that threatened him into a place of change. It was the sense that somehow from the top of his head all the way down through the contamination of the choices of his will and in his body, he just felt the mercy of God the love of God, the compassion of God, the loving kindness of the Lord. I want to say to folks who are listening this morning, here in this room or wherever you may be, the laws of God are real. The truths of God are absolutely correct. But that which will change your heart is feeling and sensing His love for you. Not not just for the world in general, but for you in particular. There are people, people had written Ross off, teachers, coaches, others contemporary. They had just written him off. He was just a trash dump. But when you get drenched by the sense of the love of God, especially in that place where you know you don't deserve it, but you sense it anyway. (laughs) There is a level of confidence that rises up, not in who you are, but in whose you are. I'd go with him. I'd go with Ross sometimes. I just, because I couldn't get enough being around him. I needed to know. I wanted, and I would begin to pray, Lord, fill me with the spirit like Ross is being filled with your spirit where he knows the reality of your presence and he knows your love Like, I don't feel like I know your love. I trust you as my Savior. I believe that you died for me. But this living, warm, flowing love of God that's changing him, rescuing him, making him different, making him so attractive in a sense. People just wanted to be around him because he was full of hope. He wasn't dealing drugs. He didn't have to do that anymore. He was full of hope and full of joy. I'd walk with Ross. Sometimes late at night in Houston to some of the places where he knew deals were going down. And he knew some of the ones that were involved in that stuff. And I was scared to death. He would walk into, walk right up to groups, into apartment complexes. We'd stop at 7-Elevens. We'd just ride until he saw somebody or saw a group pull over, park the car, and he'd just walk, walk right up in him, not, not planning to try to do a citizen's arrest, not, not, not planning on telling him, you better quit that, and you better stop that, and you better quit, cut that out. He'd walk up with a smile on his face and say, guys, I've been where you are, and I just want to tell you that there's a real Jesus and the real Jesus has rescued me, is rescued. The real Jesus loves me and has forgiven me and is working. And, I say, and then he would always say this, I just got to tell you, he loves you. 
Because if he loved me, if Jesus loved me, I can tell you he loves you. Folks, listen, some of us have grown up so stinking squeaky clean in our own estimation that we've never really felt like we needed much of the mercy of God. For goodness sake, all these other jerks and all these reprobates and all these other trashed out people, they need the mercy of God. But sometimes we, we, we don't understand how much we have needed his mercy because we've never felt like we deserved much mercy because we were doing a bunch of stuff right. You can go to hell and split hell wide open. When I start saying this, folks say, oh, great, oh, great. There he goes again talking about, well, I'm going to just say, you can. You can slip off a church pew seat into hell just like you can end up in a place of destruction when you've just fried your brain on every kind of trash dope there is out there. The Scripture says there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us need to know the mercy of God. But if you hadn't had much mercy, hadn't felt like you needed much mercy, you run around with that 12-gauge, 32-inch full choke barrel, poking that somebody. Do you all even know what that is? That's a shotgun that, that, that pointing it around and just kind of blowing folks away at their wrong stuff and their bad stuff. One we don't realize hadn't drenched our hearts yet that self-righteousness is just as much a deadly sin as anything else to be named. So the ones with the long shotgun barrel shooting people, where's your mercy? Where's your mercy? Where's your coming? Jesus would say to the Pharisees, you tithe and you need to tithe but you've lost sight of the weightier portion of the law, which is the mercy of God. Now, all of that, I went way around the world to get us back to Exodus chapter 34. Would you please find that in the second book of your Bible? Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Stop at Exodus. And I want to read these verses to us. When the Lord determined to introduce himself to the human race, when he was picking words that he wanted to be remembered as descriptive of his heart, watch these words. This is to Moses. His second trip up the Mount Sinai to get the second set of tablets with the Ten Commandments on them, the first one having been broken when he saw the people after he'd come down, falling into idolatry and worshiping something they had made with their own hands. But the Lord granted mercy, and so he allowed Moses to come back up a second time. But now look at this in verse 5, Exodus 34. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Moses calling upon the name of the Lord. Lord, Lord, Jehovah, Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, this is the Lord talking. This is not Moses speaking, describing the Lord. These are the words that the Lord spoke about himself. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, thousands of generations, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Where there is no turning back to the Lord, 
entire family lines to the third and fourth generation can be affected by the sins of the fathers and the forefathers. But that's not the heart of the Lord. That's not what's listed first. What's listed first in how the Lord wants to be remembered, how he wants us to know him. The Lord, God, compassionate and gracious. You see, each of these words are response words. They are descriptions of a heart that is responding. You, 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 it is presupposed that compassion is required. Compassion is needed because the ones whom the Lord loves are not going to be perfect. They're not going to do everything right. They're not going to remember everything. They're not going to act in the right ways. There's going to need to be compassion. The Lord is saying, I want you to know me that way. I know the streets you walk in. I know the people you're around. I know the things in your culture and your setting and your time in history. My heart for you is compassion. Not just holding up another standard. Not just giving another list of rules. But to know him means that we know him in his compassion. And gracious. That means that it's in his heart to not give what is deserved, but to give what is undeserved. Not not to pay back exactly what has been demonstrated. It's in his heart to be gracious. Let me tell you what the devil will do. Let me tell you what Satan will do, whose name is in the New Testament, the devil or diabolos. It's a compound word in the Greek. Balos or balo to throw. Dia between. Throw between. Satan will work overtime to try to insert something between you and God. He'll do it with a lie many times. If he can convince you, if he can convince any of us that God is not compassionate, that God is not gracious, then he can keep you in the place of perpetuating condemnation and wrong behavior because there's no God of compassion to go back to. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't have any time for you. Look at all that you've done. Satan will lie, and he will lie to us individually in ways that he knows he's got a button he can push. But the truth is, the heart of your real father, if you've received Jesus as Savior and Lord, the heart of your real father is compassion. The heart of your real father is gracious, meaning that he wants to give. He knows he's going to need to give in order for the relationship to be restored and maintained. He's going to have to bestow upon the child things that the child doesn't deserve in the merciful sense, in the good sense. Father, looking at a two-year-old or a three or a four-year-old, And the child can want certain things that if left alone would destroy the child. Wanting to be given permission to do certain things that could harm the child. So the parent who loves the child, out of compassion, will have to say, no, not now. That won't work. Because the child doesn't understand. Sometimes we can take that as the Lord is saying, as something is prevented, something is stopped. We we can take that as meaning the Lord's not watching out for us. The Lord doesn't care. God's mad at me. And the enemy sits over here on 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 the barbed wire fence underneath the mesquite tree just trying to keep on hammering that. You're right. 
He doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't know anything, and he doesn't, you, you've done too much for, to merit anything good from him. But the truth this morning is, the truth this morning is, thus saith the Lord, your Father is compassionate. Your Father is gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps thousands, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Let me give you another synonym or two for that word truth. Faithfulness. Loyalty. He's abounding in loyalty. He's abounding in faithfulness. Some have experienced the pain of an unfaithful father in this life. And we can come up with the idea, well, I can't really count on God because my father, my earthly father or parent, abandoned me. Thus saith the Lord, your heavenly father is faithful. He's not going to find somebody else that he likes better than you and take off with them. He's loyal. If he pledges, he fulfills. He's loyal to you, even when there can be seasons in our lives when we have been disloyal to him. Now, folks, I I, I want you to just let let me finish this, this, this thought. When that drops 18 inches and the devil is no longer able to convince you that God hates you or that God is ignoring you or that God is distracted into other things more important than you, when that drops 18 inches, that the God of all creation not only knows your name, but he knows your heart and he loves your heart. And he wants you. He invites you on the basis of his first loving us. He invites us to respond to that love. Lord, I'm guilty of sin. Lord, I have made wrong choices. Lord, I have run away from you at times. But as David did, I'm coming back to that place where your word says that you are compassionate. And you are gracious, even though I know I don't deserve grace, even though I don't deserve compassion. You remember that story of David and Bathsheba and Uriah and David taking Uriah's wife, getting her pregnant, and then having Uriah murdered. You remember that? Guilty of adultery. Guilty of murder. When you find your way to Psalm 51, and David is writing coming out of that season, that that dark night of the soul, he writes, be gracious to me, O God. Look, according to your loving kindness. He was casting himself upon the mercy of God. He was casting himself guilty, caught, Casting himself upon the loving kindness of God. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. I'm not hiding my sins. I'm not calling them other things. But I'm bringing my sins. I'm not taking them to the world. I'm not taking them to trash heaps. I'm not taking them away. I'm bringing my sins and I'm bringing them to you, and the part of you I'm bringing them to is your compassion. I'm bringing my guilt, I'm bringing my shame to your loving kindness in hopes that there will be response, not from your judgment, not from your justice, but there will be response to me from your compassion. Folks, I'm going to tell you, 
That can revolutionize things. You say, well, if I tell people that God loves them, they're just going to stay farther and farther in their ways of being away from God. What if the opposite is the truth? What if the reason some folks listen to me right now this morning, the reason that you hadn't felt like you could return to the Lord is because you felt like the Lord was already so mad at you when your name comes up, he spits on the floor. But what if the opposite is the truth? He's been loving you every step of your way. There's been compassion in his heart to be poured out on you every night, every day, every in between. That he's been there waiting, longing. It's in his heart. But the devil is saying, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. You can't ever go back. He'll just, he'll destroy you if you go back. Or there's no God. Some stay away from them because there just must not be any God. But what if? What if the place like old Ross, he had been to Bible school, he had been to church, he had grown up in different things, but none of those things held him. But what won his heart was when he knew he had no hope unless the God he wasn't even sure existed would have mercy on him. And lo and behold, when he turned his heart up, God, I don't even know if you're real. But if you're real, I need you to help me. And the God that so loved the world that he gave Jesus, so loved Ross Hargrove in that shower that day and changed him. By the power of his mercy, by the power of his grace. And I'm standing up here today, 40 years later, slinging and hollering and stomping, still impacted by the way the love of God, the love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God transformed a lost, a lost, a lost soul. An amazingly measurable way. Do you see why, and we're going to come, come back to this maybe in some of the days to come. Be here a little bit. We're on this subject maybe for a little bit. Do you see why Paul would say it is so important that the function of the Spirit being poured out in the life of the believer is the cry of the Son, Jesus, within the heart of the believer, and the cry is, Abba, Father. Abba, Father, not, oh, unknowable, holy God somewhere, but Abba, Father. I love telling this story, and I'll finish with this. We were in Jerusalem several years ago, and it was Passover week. We went in to have a time together in our group in a hotel in Jerusalem. Families were gathered in the banquet area, and they were having their meals together. I don't remember anything else about that trip, but I remember this one thing. There was a little girl, beautiful little girl, four, five, maybe six, dark hair, long, curly Dark hair, just beautiful. And she looked, I just noticed her, and she looked like she was lost. She she couldn't see anybody that she recognized. But then across the room, she saw a man. And as she began to go toward that man, these were the word, this was the word out of her mouth. Abba, Abba, it was her daddy. And she, she went to him, and as best I remember, when she got to him, he picked her up and held her. Now, she may have wandered off toward the soft-serve ice cream dispenser. I mean, who, who knows why she, where, how she got lost? or if she was even lost, but that was the cry of her heart. Abba, do you hear that? 
Do you hear that? Instead of it being an unknowable God or an angry God or a distanced God or a disengaged God, the Spirit of Jesus inside you is crying out, Abba. Meaning I know he loves me. Meaning I know I have a place in his heart. Meaning I know he knows I'm not perfect and I have messed up and there have been things I wish I could do over again, but I can't. But it's still in my heart to cry, Abba. So you pick out. Pick out the most disgusting lifestyle, the most despicable profession. You pick one out and name it or two. And as we've said, you insert that in the New Testament at every place you see tax gatherers and sinners listed. They were the lowest of the low in the eyes of the culturally expressive and aware in his day. But the writer of Luke says it looked like that every one of those tax gatherers were coming to Jesus to be around him. Why? Why? He's the most holy man who ever walked the earth. They could have been categorized as the most dirty, the most morally bankrupt on the earth. Why? Were they drawn to him? Because God so loved the world. It wasn't that God so hated specific sins and the sinners who would participate in them that he just didn't want to have anything to do. It was because he loved us in the middle of what our sins were. We hadn't changed anything. We hadn't quit nothing. Excuse the grammar. But he loved me. Right where I was, right in the middle of my things. And it is his love that will win you. And it is his love that will keep you. Abba sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You know who your real daddy is? He's the richest person in the universe. He's the most powerful individual such that there is no threat to his existence. If he ran out of gold, he can just create some more. He's the one who spoke and every molecule came into its assigned and prearranged configuration. He is the one who holds it all together. So if it gets too crazy, if it gets too out of hand, he can just say the opposite of come forth, he can say disperse. And there'll be nothing left to oppose it. Think about that. Abba. Father. And David would say, you delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Even though he knows us, he knows what we're prone to do. He knows what we're prone to stay away from. He knows us. Loves us. He loves us. Could I pray for us? Lord, you, you know who you're talking to this morning. You know where we are. Lord, I ask by the power of your truth, by the power of your spirit, that you will just destroy the lie of Satan that has caused there to be some kind of a distance between us and you, the lie being that God may love, but he doesn't love me. God may be compassionate to other folks, but he doesn't have compassion for me. 
God may be lovingly kind and gracious to others, but he's not to me. Lord, 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 we bring that into the light. We bring that into the light before you. We expose it. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us for the sin of unbelief, forgive us for the sin of doubt and unbelief. And you know what the circumstances have been to bring us to tolerate those kinds of conclusions. So here we are. Lord, will you have mercy on us? Will you pour out your compassion upon us and will you wash away the fears? Will you wash away the doubts? Will you, will you seal again that gap of trust between us and you? Lord, will you pour out your spirit? I, I just ask you to do it. Everywhere this is going, whoever will hear this, Lord, pour out your spirit of adoption into our hearts that we may find ourselves crying out with joy, with confidence, with rest, with a future and a hope. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. I ask you to take this 18 inches beyond the hearing of the ear into the placement in the heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You want to know the greatest difference you can make in somebody that you're worried about the way they're living, worried about what's going on? Go back to how Jesus did it. The ones he spent the most time lecturing and trying to straighten out were the religious police who was saying, you do what I tell you, don't do what I do, because I'm not doing what I'm telling people to do. It was the religious police that were pointing out the faults in everybody else. But how did he do it? Zacchaeus, the wee little man who was up in the sycamore tree, he was a chief tax collector. And Jesus walked under the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down, because I'm going to your house today. The writer of the first book in the New Testament, the longest of the four Gospels, was written by Levi, Matthew, a former tax gatherer. It's not just that he rescues into some kind of a place of more expected or, or accepted decency. He said he's got designs. He's got a plan. His, his mercy is so great, his compassion is so great that he would turn a guy like Saul of Tarsus into a leader of the church. He, 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 would, he would turn Matthew into a writer of amazing truth involving his life. But what did he do with Matthew? He walked up to him sitting behind his task desk. Matthew hadn't repented of nothing. Matthew hadn't given a dime to his organization. Matthew hadn't been baptized in the Jordan River by, the, by, by John. Jesus just walked up to him and said, follow me. Follow me. Those who try to analyze and go over leadership and the selection of leadership just freak out over Jesus' choices of leadership. He didn't take him through a leadership planning or the training course. He Follow me, because he knew if he would just stay close to Jesus, he would be walking away from the trash in his life. It's all about Jesus. It's all about a relationship with him. We don't need to stop this and start that and then find him. No, just right where you are, right in the middle of whatever it is, right in the middle of your tax gathering desk. Just start following Jesus. And because he is compassionate and because he is gracious, and because he's full of loving kindness, he'll take you right where you and I are, and he'll make something out of us that we could never make of ourselves. Oh, my goodness. Alamo City is sort of a story to that effect. I know we dress up, we clean up, we hair's a little different, and we got, you know, stuff covered up underneath some of our sleeves. Bottom line is, around this place, we know 
sinners saved by grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. Oh, goodness, but now I see. I remember old Ross getting a guitar, and I'm telling you, he couldn't sing it worth a hoot. But he got a guitar, and he learned four or five chords, and he was sitting on the bench at a youth camp out in the middle of some pine trees in Mississippi, waking the camp up, just hitting that thing. I think going to break the string, no nylon guitar. And he was just making up a song about loving Jesus. Kept on for 20 minutes, just singing his lungs out. He had been lifting his voice in praise to trash. And now the Jesus who came inside him was turning around those same vocal cords and he was praising something that was worth praising. And he just couldn't quit. And here I am all these years later telling you the story about that. The love of God setting a man free. The love of God putting hope back in a life. And the truth that who the Father's heart really is heart that is compassionate and gracious and full of loving kindness and truth. Let him love you. Come back to him. Come back to him. He abundantly pardons. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be reminded of these words. Lord, will you just Will you just stir a fresh fire of joy and thankfulness in our hearts as we have reviewed these words from your word? Lord, I just sense that there's a cry going out to ones who were far off and are wondering if there could ever be a way back. May they hear it. Yes, there's a way back. The Lord hasn't changed one bit in his love for you. His compassion is real. His power to rescue is beyond description. Come home, come home, come back, come back, come back to the Lord who loves you. Lord, will you let them, whoever it is who needs to hear that, respond. Respond to your voice. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen.